Welcome to J Life with Daniel. I'm your host, Rabbi Daniel Levine. Today, we are joined by Professor Jeffrey Bludinger, who is the Director of Jewish Studies at Cal State Long Beach. Just a short bio, he received his bachelor's, his master's, his JD, and his PhD all at UCLA, my alma mater. <laughs> it is always nice to welcome a, a fellow Bruin to the podcast. Professor Bludinger, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's it's yeah. I I never went to the football games, but yeah, go Bruins. <laughs> Neither did I. They were always on Saturday, so I was more <laughs> yeah. of a, a basketball person. You know, Polly Pickle okay. was right there in the middle of campus. Um, so we'll hopefully get to discussing all of your research and all of your academic interests, hopefully during the latter half. But I wanted to start off with sort of what I guess this week you're famous for, which yeah. is the uh, incident at uh, San Jose University, probably four or five days ago. If you can sort of Give a little bit of the background. What were you doing there? And then hopefully we can start to uh, tease out wider trends within the college world. Yeah. So this actually, um, I would have been asked a few months ago if I would come up to San Jose State to talk to a class on literature of the Holocaust about the peace process. You know, and this is a part, it was a part of a service learning project that the professor was doing uh, and looking at uh, the conflict between Israel and Palestine and how to which where the conflict comes from and how to achieve peace. So it was going to be a quick trip, fly up Monday morning a week ago, speak to the class, fly home the same day. And when I was picked up at the airport is when the director of Jewish studies told me that there was a problem. That over the weekend, uh, the campus police had picked up chatter on the internet about my talk, that a, a radical group out of Oakland had, you know, plastered my face all over the internet, whereas condemning the talk. And that was calling on massive numbers of protesters to descend on the campus. Now, the talk, I was supposed to originally talk in the library, but the campus police were concerned that the library, that room only had one door. And that if the protesters were outside, then that we would be trapped in the, the room. So they asked the organizers to move the talk. So we moved it to the, the actual classroom of the class. And that built the idea was that building has a secure entrance. And um We'd only tell the students in the class where the talk would be. Otherwise, everyone else would know that the class, the talk had been moved without knowing where. And in the meantime, they considered it, uh, the plan had been originally been I would be, you know, dropped off at the library and work for a couple hours, and then maybe go to lunch. And they were saying, no, it's not safe for you to be in the library. Your, your people will recognize you. It's not safe to go to a restaurant in San Jose. People will recognize you. As I told the organizers, I've never felt so seen and important. Um, <laughs> it's it's really a strange situation. I, I do you know nineteenth century you know Jewish history. So um, as soon as they announced to the class where the talk was, within thirty to sixty minutes, the organizer of the protest were sending out messages where my talk was going to be. So now it was um, the campus police sent an unmarked car to pick me up. I was at an apartment next to campus of the or, um, organizers. They drove me to the building, and then there were like three officers came into me, the building with me. And as we approached the stairway to go upstairs, there were, we could see three protesters in kafias coming through the secure door, because it turns out to get into the building, all you need is a pass key that any student has on their card. So it's not particularly secure. So they sent an officer upstairs, and they, after a few minutes, they came back down, and they said, okay, follow us. And so we, uh, I, it's, you know, walk down a short corridor and then a right turn down a long corridor and the whole length of the way, both corridors lined with protesters screaming at me. One of them held out a sign to block my path and I wasn't going to bother, I wasn't going to dodge. And so last moment they, they yanked it back and didn't hit me with it. And then I went into the classroom. And um, so in the classroom, there are two doors to the classroom on that hallway. Uh, and the police were kind of keeping the back door free of protesters as a way of getting in and out. And then there was an officer at the door to the class and the professor was only admitting admit, uh, enrolled students. And there were a lot of screaming and the provost dropped by because I actually knew the provost, know the provost when he used to be a professor, he used to be chair of geography here at Cal State Long Beach. So we chatted, nice to catch up with him. He's a really, uh, Vincent Del Casino, really great guy. And so eventually he got started. And I think um, uh, Leah, the professor whose class it was, you know, tried to speak and there was a lot of screaming from the uh, outside. And then I got up and I started to talk to the class and I just was going to talk about sort of where the conflict comes from, why it's not a conflict from time immemorial. It actually, 
begins in the 20th century. It's not a conflict that begins with the Zionist movement. And um, then I was actually just getting to the part where the conflict comes from, which is a fight over who gets to farm land and peasants who were displaced in the decade before World War I. And that's when all hell broke loose. But um, so I was going to talk about sort of, you know, what the core issues of the conflict are, you know, we'll call the 1948 portfolio of issues and then the 1967 portfolio and the various efforts to find a peaceful resolution and how agonizingly close the parties reached in 2000, in, in January, February, 2001, mm -hmm. in which they had tentative, they were really, really close on almost all the issues to resolve the conflict. Yeah. The so part, just in case, I mean, just just to highlight for listeners, in case it's not clear from everything you're saying, you are not coming in here with a uh, staunch Zionist, you know, Israel is right and rah, rah, you know, what they're doing in Gaza is is just, you are really coming in with both the academic and also pedagogical background of saying, okay, let's, let's observe this from a historical perspective. Here are, you know, both sides. Here's what the Israelis have wanted. Here's what the Palestinians have wanted. And so, you know, even so, this didn't deter any of the... Uh, people outside. And in fact, that was their objection. Because I was calling for peace between Israel and Palestine. I was talking about a peaceful resolution of the conflict between Israel and Palestine. I was talking about how Israelis and Palestinians could reach peace. And on almost all the issues, we actually know what the final agreement will look like. And if, if you want to want to look it up, go Google Taba, Taba Talks 2001. Taba spelled T-A-B-A. Uh, you know, we all familiar with the collapse of the Camp David II, but the negotiators kept it up and they actually came very, very close to Taba, uh, including issues of Jerusalem, including boundaries between Israel and Palestine, including like the Temple Mount. It, they actually came, the, the only issue that they couldn't reach resolution on, and it's the toughest issue, is the 1948 refugees and their descendants because that's not a compromisable issue. One party will have to concede. Either um, Israel will allow the 1948 refugees and their descendants to come in, which in case it will cease to exist, it will become a binational state, or uh, the 1948 refugees and their descendants will have to take some alternate compensation. You can't have a, there's no halfway point on that. It's the only one that's an either or. Um, and that's why it's the toughest issue to solve. And that's what I was going to talk about. But the the protesters, it's funny you said I, I'm not a Zionist. In a way, I am. That was a question well, I was sorry, asking. Sorry, sorry. I don't mean that well, you're I not a Zionist. No, I mean, you was, come in with a Zionist agenda. You're not coming in with uh, waving Israeli flags. I'm and... not calling for you know a Jewish state on both sides of the Jordan River. It's not a maximalist. It's not like there's no such thing as Palestine. The Palestinians should be uh, go leave. You know, I'm that's not my position at all. Um, it's funny, I was asked, are you, know, are you a Zionist? And I said, well, it's a strange question to ask because in some ways Zionism ended in 1948 when Israel became a state. That was the goal of the Zionist movement to create the state of Israel. You know, now that the state is created, it doesn't that mean that it's no longer a movement. I mean, you have religious Zionism, which sees, you know, the goal is a messianic achievement, a messianic end. So that's an ongoing, you have cultural Zionism, but, um, for the most part, Zionism achieved its end in 1948. So what does it mean to be a Zionist now when there is a state of Israel? You're like, yeah, you know, I think that this, I think that the largest Jewish community in the world should continue to exist. Um, you know, so I, it should not be destroyed. But uh, that makes, so the argument was, oh, he's a Zionist, he wants a state of Israel to exist. Because um, they, they want, they don't want, they, they're not calling for peace. It's the peace of the dead. Um, they want Israel to be abolished. Uh, they're kind of agnostic on what should happen to all the Jews there, whether killed or expelled. Um, well, it's a sort of historical fallacy. I mean, I've, I've confronted this on campus, you know, just I've been living on a college campus, which, you know, undergrad, grad school, and now uh, working for Hillel and also uh, adjuncting for the last, you know, 15 years at this point. Yeah. And there, it really is this sort of fallacy of Jewish history that one, all modern Israelis descend from Europe. And so oh, they sort yeah. of cut out the 55% of of Jews that come from the Middle East and Mizrahi Jews, you know, that's a whole separate question. Um, but for them, they really have bought into this narrative that Zionism is just colonialism. And if Zionism is just colonialism, then if you punch back hard enough, as you know, happened in Algeria, you know, then the colonists just leave and and they go back home. And so there's sort of this 
this gray area view and a lot of, you know, staunch anti-Zionist heads that, you know, if things get bad enough, Jews will sort of go back to where they came from. And I'm for those who are just listening, I'm putting that in air quotes, because of course, where they came from have almost all kicked the Jews out, whether we're talking about Ashkenazi Jews or Mizrahi Jews. And so, they're, yeah, they haven't exactly figured that part out yet. Yeah. And I think the Algeria is really interesting because I think it is the Algerian model is, and I don't think it's not just activists on campus. I think that's the model for Hamas. Oh, sure. I think Hamas and Hezbollah believe that if they just massacred enough people, if they just hurt Israel enough, then somehow, you know, that Israel would invade and they'd lose. And then they're all just going to go away. And that's the, it's like, we're going to, you know, it worked in Algeria, so it's going to work here. And they don't, they don't understand the reality that it's not going to happen. That, that, that the, you know, as you say, 55, 57% of Israelis are of Middle Eastern origin. Um, almost all, most Israelis, whether uh, either of Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, came as refugees. Um, the whole settler colonial thing, I had a slide on that. Um, it's complicated, um, but because of course there were colonies, right? You had, you know, the palace, you know, the, the Jewish colonial society in the 1860s, right? They had settlements. So if you have settlers and you had colonies, it's in settler colonialism. And it has aspects of it, right? You know, the British is the colonial, British is the colonial power. Britain is supporting Zionism for about 20 years from the Balfour Declaration up to the white paper. But um, unlike when you look at any other settler colonial state, whether the United States or Canada, Australia, um, they're all people that the, the, the colonial power encourages members of its own state to come and settle for economic and political reasons. And it's an arm of the state. Um, Zionism was not an arm of a colonial power. Uh, they weren't representing most of the Jews who moved to Palestine were and came after the formation, they were refugees. Um, and what does it mean to go back to the ancestral homeland? Um, I don't want to get into the whole indigeneity issue, um, cause, but because the thing is, it's like everyone say, well, you know, Palestinians are indigenous. Um, indigeneity is a social construct, just like nationalism. Uh, how long do you have to live in a place to be indigenous? How long do you have to be gone from a place to be no longer indigenous? <clears throat> so indigeneity, <clears throat> sorry, it's a rhetorical device. Sure. Yeah. And and I'll just say on that, I mean, what, one of the things I always tell students, um, and then we can, uh, you know, transport yeah. ourselves back to uh, San, San Jose last week, is that you can't understand Zionism <clears throat> without understanding colonialism. But if you only understand colonialism, there's no chance you're going to be able to understand Zionism, where exactly what you said, both Hamas, I believe in the uh, PLO, so um, mm -hmm. the original Yasser Arafat or Mahmoud Abbas is sort yeah. of uh, an assessor afterwards, a, a great book to just understanding, I think, how a lot of anti-Israel activists view this conflict. There's a book called The Savage War of Peace that's about um, mm -hmm. the Algerian revolution against the French there. And it sort of, again, describes this uh, classic playbook of anti-colonialism. Uh, you make things really, really, really bad, and then things get worse, even for you, because the French, you know, push down even harder. And then one day, out of nowhere, it's almost sort of messianic thinking, they all get up and leave, which is, of course, what happened during the French Revolution. And I really do think, and, and I say sadly, both sadly for, for Israel, but also sadly for the Palestinians, because God knows this isn't this isn't the playbook that's going to actually help them get peace. They yeah. are thinking that, you know, there's going to be these, you know, spike in violence and these spirals, and it's going to get worse, and then you're going to reach some unknown threshold, and then it's going to, you know, okay, all the Zionists are going to pick up one day and leave. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, for for those who have a good understanding of Zionism and Jewish history and just Jewish sociology, that that of course is not going to happen. And so they're sort of digging in just, you know, the complete wrong direction here. Um, so we have that. We have a book recommendation for listeners. So let's oh, go and back. So you, if you've so never seen the movie The Battle for Algiers, brilliant, brilliant film about laying out how that whole process worked. As far as I know, the only film simultaneously used by the U.S. government and terrorist groups as a training film. So the U.S. government uses a training film on how not to respond to an insurgency, and terrorist groups use it because it shows how to create a terrorist cell and carry out terrorist actions. Really, really powerful film. Sorry. That is fascinating. Um, okay, so you're here to give this talk. You are... Uh trying to advocate for peace based off of your academic understanding of 
the last hundred or so years of, of history and all of the tension points, you come in, the outside is lined with uh, protesters, it's loud. Um, what happens then? Okay, so um, as long as the door to the classroom was closed, I could be heard. Um, I have a very loud voice. I have been told I do not have an interior an inner, uh, 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 an interior voice. I just, right. but once the door, every time the door opened, the loud, the noise became so loud the students couldn't focus, and protesters kept trying to come into the room. There was a tall woman who's um, either is a professor or works for another professor who was protesting me. Um, and that I found, I didn't know later until later who was in the hall, but the people in the hall included professors and one administrator, an associate dean, um, who were trying to deny me academic freedom. It's a very, uh, anyhow, so they kept trying to come in. Um, and then four students got up and left. And they had been on the left side of my way speaking, and they always kind of looked they didn't, when you're teaching a class, you can kind of see how students looked at you and they always, they looked angry at me, mm -hmm. which I didn't know why, because I'd never met them before. Anyhow, they all got up and left. And then about two, three minutes later, um, a police officer came up to me and said, we're evacuating you from the classroom. Um, and at the time I didn't know why. Um, and so I had to like disconnect my computer and get in my bag and I come out the door and there are four officers, one on each side of me, two, one in front, one behind and two on one on the left, one on the right. And they kind of cr created a space between me and the protesters behind me. So I couldn't see what was happening behind me because I was had to leave. I think someone was pushing the officer behind me because he kept falling into me. Anyhow, so then I was down the corridor and out the building. And then my understanding was they evacuated the other uh, faculty and students from the room right after me. And then I was driven in an unmarked car back to police headquarters in the campus. And then I, by that, at that point, I heard that they were, had been going to bring in the San Jose police to clear the the whole corridor. And, um, but that- Do we know what happened that sort of prompted the emergency evacuation? So I, I don't, I believe the, as far as I can tell the, the, the course of events were, and I only know this from news reports, there was a professor, a Jewish professor coming to my talk who walked the same gauntlet of protesters. He's well known to the, the protesters and they were screaming at him and he took out his camera to film them. And one of the protesters tried to block his cell phone. And um, in the and then what happened next is, I, I mean, I've watched the video and it's all very blurry to me. Though the LA Times simply said, Professor Blumenger uh, chose not, said he had no comment on the video, but I didn't know what, I don't know what happened in the videos to me, it's very unclear. Anyhow, they heard a screaming that he hit the student and that he twisted the student's arm. Anyhow, at that point, there was a lot of uproar in the hall. Um, the police wanted to clear the hall and um, they didn't have the forces to do so. The protesters weren't going to leave. And at that point they had called in the San Jose and what the the universe the president of the university who called me five days later i got a call from our president on our campus the next day san jose state where i was evicted from their campus called me five days later just i will put that out there uh she said that they were concerned that bringing in the san jose police if they had to clear the corridor would create a calamity she called it in the corridor and so in order to get the protesters out of the building the idea was to remove me and the students. And then if I and the students were no longer in the building, the protesters would no longer have a reason to remain. And so in fact, then left the building. But they did so at the cost of my academic freedom and the academic freedom of the students. So that is my understanding, but I don't, you know, from what the president uh, of that university told me and what I've read in the press. Um, so since then, then I was uh, driven off campus and to the airport. Um, and um, the the situation there has been quite bad since, it's, and the faculty there have it much much worse. Um, I don't, I can't really, I don't want to talk about the health issues that the professor's class I was speaking in had, but it, they're quite severe, and she's yeah. not in a good physical state right now. And her both in I, terms of the, yeah, she so, had a, so what, she had a heart what attack. Do we, what do we? Oh wow, okay, yeah. I did not realize that. on Saturday. Scary. On Saturday, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That is crazy. So. Just, just zooming out. What yeah. do we, what do we make of this? Because I know, you know, listeners are well aware that I, you know, I'm, I'm at UCI. I teach at UCI. I'm part of Hill at UCI. I won't give any names, but I know 
also a whole series of academic talks have gotten disrupted at UC Irvine to the point where now the school is actually not even really trying to host all of these nuanced academic discussions about Israel and what's been happening in the war in Gaza. Um, from from my perspective, it's, it's obviously a shame because, you know, I, I sort of still have with me this sort of idealistic view of uh, academia and the university. I mean, on a personal level, the university was a time of great intellectual and ideological exploration for me. And I specifically in undergrad relished the opportunities to go to both classes and also academic talks of people that I disagreed with on a whole host of religious and political views. And, and honestly, those were some of my uh, most cherished memories of getting coffee with professors that I disagreed with and just, you know, the amount of learning and back and forth. Yeah. That is obviously not the case now, but I still hold a little bit of that idealism. And I would think if you were to tell somebody in the abstract that there's going to be this, you know, obviously this current iteration of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the people and the institution that is the most important in trying to handle this in terms of educating the next generation and being able to have these sort of nuanced conversations where let's try to understand both sides, that should be the university. Whereas it seems like the university has become, and I'm, I'm curious if you agree or disagree with this characterization, actually the most toxic place to be in in our society trying to talk about Israel. What do you think happened? Is this sort of, you know, without trying, you know, without me sounding like, you know, I'm an old 80 year old, you know, right winger that's talking about the kids. Get off my lawn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I mean, to some extent, that's, that's how I feel sometimes because, you know, on the one hand, you know, when I'm facing the wider community, my, my intuition is always to, to defend academia and the university, obviously not every idea that comes out of it, but the system I think is generally a good one of, you know, freedom of speech, academic freedom, you know, this, you know, this sort of experimental lab where students go for four years and they can, you know, meet people different than them and get their ideas challenged. But it seems like in actuality, you know, whenever I'm internal to the university, it seems like at, at worst, there's sort of, uh, or sorry, at best, there's sort of this endless bureaucracy that doesn't really know how to handle these uh, tougher issues. And at worst, it actually seems like a lot of the suppression of ideas is actually coming from some professors in the university itself. So I, I'm just throwing, you know, a smorgasbord of uh, questions onto you, but sort of what do you make of this? Is this is this new? You've obviously been ac in academia for a while and sort of what's your uh, vantage point here? Okay, so yes, it's new, I would say. I, I First, I wanna say that um, it's not a majority, what we're seeing, the problem is not coming from a majority of faculty. Um, I would make it, I would say, you know, if you look at the demogra political demographics of faculty, most faculty are liberal, right? And I mean that liberal, like liberal, they, they support higher education, they support academic freedom, they want peace between Israel and Palestine. They're classic, just liberals. And they don't have a problem, they're, they're not the ones suppressing speech. Um, what they're doing is, what the group, what we are seeing is a radical group. It's relatively small on campus, but it's very vocal. Uh, and this is a radical group um, and it's radical on a whole bunch of issues, not just Israel, Palestine, but uh, they wanna shut down any, disc any discussion that isn't anti-Israel, uh, that isn't pro-Hamas. Um, and they are, uh, and we're seeing this uh, particularly since October 7th, since the massacres. So you see what happened at Berkeley yesterday when an Israeli speaker uh, was supposed to speak in a building, the building was surrounded, uh, they broke windows, they tried to force their way in past the police, the police uh, canceled the guy's talk, the Israeli's talk. And this is, of course, you know, the, the irony of night. Berkeley is that was the uh, center of the free speech movement, yes. of, you know, allowing speech that you specifically disagree with. And so the, the flop in 50 years is is fascinating. Sorry to cut you off there. No, no, but, but the point is, it's free speech for me, but not for thee. And um, that is, I have the right, you know, so if you're anti-Israel, it's fine. You can talk anywhere on campus and there won't be a problem. There won't be protest. There won't be counter protesters. There won't, we have the the current apartheid wall, right? I, if I look to my left, I can see the apartheid wall out the window this week. Um, they There have been probably a dozen an, uh, anti-Israel speakers on our campus um, since the massacre. There have been multiple rallies. Uh, one student group uh, made the New York Times because the day after the massacre, the day after the massacre, they posted an image 
of a flyer uh, calling for uh, an anti-Israel rally uh, showing um, a paraglider. Yeah, which we have that team right in departments that you see Irvine yeah. as well. And it was posted just outside my building, you know, uh, that was, and no, there was no one interrupted their talk. No one uh, stopped them from speaking. Um, we've had no, the, the first pro Israel or uh, talk we had was last Wednesday and I needed police protection. Right. Um, the, uh, I got, you know, the, uh, originally the university police said, well, you can pay us 120. Well, we'll station a security officer. If you pay us $120 in overtime, and then the university president called me that night and said, don't worry, there'll be an officer there. Do you want to pay for it? Um, and actually, it turned out fine. No, there wasn't any, uh, uh, no one came. And it was quite peaceful. And I felt a little embarrassed. I made all this thing about getting a police officer. But it was two days after what happened in Santa, San Jose. And so, you know, I looked to what do I do? I'm bringing in a speaker, Amy Elman, next month. She's going to talk about violence against women and the Hamas-Israel conflict. You know. I have to worry about our safety. Um, you know, uh, I don't have that. No other group has to worry about that, but Jews do. And it's a ca campus after campus. And the, the so the question is, why doesn't the administration, why doesn't campus administration more broadly across the U.S. protect the academic and free speech rights of Jews? And it's because they're they don't they're confused and they don't know how to deal with it. Um, I heard a professor say you know, last fall, you know, if you had um, masked protesters with tiki torches going through campus chanting, Jews will not replace us, administration knows exactly what that is. That's anti-Semitism, that's racism, that's wrong. They're out, they'll stop, they'll, they'll be, they, they can't stop the protest. Well, they can stop the torches burning, but, you know, but they know what to do. If the same people were chanting, Zionists will not replace us, now the administration gets very confused. They don't know what that is. They don't know what to do with it. And um, and, and, and in many ways, it, university administrations more broadly, not specific on our campus, specifically for our campus, but more broadly, have hobbled themselves. Because, you know, I'm a big believer in DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And DEI will give you the tools to do what it should give you the tools to deal with anti-Semitism um, and attempts to suppress speech. But too often, DEI just becomes E, equity. And we have to support disempowered groups only. And Jews are not disempowered, and therefore, they don't get protected. So we lose the diversity. We lose the inclusion. And the result is that administrations have hobbled themselves. They don't know how to deal with it. And so the idea is, well, we don't want to harm the students. And so we'll let them show well, it. it you know, if we have to balance the rights of Jews to speak and the rights of students to um, uh, not be arrested for uh, for violating other students' rights, well, we're going to come down on not arresting students. Yeah. And and if Jews lose their freedom of speech, well, it's 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 just a small thing. And yeah, this, this might be a very pessimistic what I'm about to say. So again, feel free to to push back. You know, if, if you disagree. It, it seems like one of the interesting things we're seeing with universities, I mean, you know, obviously university prices are going up, right? I'm not talking about the Cal States, just in yeah. general in the country, especially. And even at the Cal States, yeah. Also public schools, right? Tuition is going up. Universities are hiring more administrators and more bureaucrats that are not sort of academically trained. That also coincides with what I almost call the the commercialization of universities to the extent where a lot of the students are almost becoming the product. Oh, and yeah. Just like if I go to a restaurant and I don't like the food, it doesn't make a difference if the chef comes out and says, no, actually, this is a great steak. If I'm the customer, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, caveat, you know, well, the customer is always right. Universities have have almost seemed to, to shift, at least in my analysis, from viewing education as the final product to students as the final product. And so as long as we keep the students happy and as long as enrollment in courses is up and as long as we don't make national news for bad things, okay, you know, all was well, let's let's try not to, you know, worry about, you know, protecting everybody's free speech rights or the fact that, you know, again, there's there's a lot of different ways to to frame this. Um, but I think it's definitely connected to a lot of the wider, more systemic problems yeah. with the university. Um, and 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 I think also, I mean, I, I obviously have a very vested interest in this. You also obviously have a vested interest in 
bringing back, I think, the the humanities writ large back to a state of prestige. I mean, it's it it's sad when I talk to people that are not at the university about the university and just, I mean, obviously Republicans and conservatives, you have about 50% of the country, you know, before we even start the conversation that thinks, you know, yeah. humanities in the university is just a bunch of, you know, liberal gobbledygook, you know, whatever, let's put that aside. But even among, you know, Democrats and liberals, you know, it's it's shifting. And, you know, when I talk to to people, they say, well, I would never want my kid to go to a university and not study computer science or pre-med. You know, if they do that, fine. You know, those those fields haven't been infected. But I mean, what would you say? Because I've, I've you know, had this experience a lot, you know, as a Hillel rabbi, I get a lot of uh, calls yeah. from uh, prospective parents of, of high schoolers, you know, who say, you know, my son or my daughter really wants to come to, you know, insert school here. Um, they're really interested in, you know, history or political science or, or English. I'm afraid to let them because I don't know if they're going to, you know, end up coming out some, you know, brainwashed, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what would you sort of say to that? Or, or, or the, the bigger question, what what needs to be fixed so that I sure. no longer get those phone calls? Oh, God. Well, this is a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a huge problem. Um, there's so many different elements of it. So first of all, um, the idea that one shouldn't mad, major in the humanities that you'll end up being, uh, you know, if you get it, I, 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 my BA is in English Lit. You know, I got an English Lit degree in 1984. And I remember being told back in the early 80s, you know, what can you do with an English Lit degree? You know, say, do you want fries with that? Right now, then now about 20 years later, they say, oh, you will be a barista. You know, that's, you know, you can only go get a job at Starbucks. Yeah, I, I got a job at a major law firm with my English law degree as a lawyer making a lot of money before I decided to go back into academia. But you can make a lot, you know, the fact is that um, um, too often, and this is a really, really, this is this is not new. This goes back half a century sure. or longer. People have a tendency to think of universities as vocational schools, right? What's the most popular major? Business. It's all magical thinking, right? If I get a degree in business, then a business will hire me. That's not the way it works. Business degree trains you how to open your own business, how to be an entrepreneur, not how to get hired by a business. You know, it doesn't, you know, you can, if you, it, you end up not being able to, how do you get the job that hasn't been invented yet? You know, think about right now, everyone's focusing on AI, right? Five years ago, how many people were focusing on AI? I mean, it did exist in a form, how, what degree, what would you have studied five years ago in order to get that job now? It didn't exist then. Now it does. If you need um, training in how to think outside the box, to be able to adapt and take advantage of opportunities that don't exist yet. You won't get that if you go for a STEM degree, right? If you're focusing on one area of STEM, and that might be a growing area, whatever, but you, it won't train you to think outside the box. That's what the liberal arts do. And yeah. I always tell people, it doesn't matter what you major in, in the liberal arts. It doesn't matter where you're history, poli sci, English, religious studies, it's all the same in, in because- Yeah, no, that that, that I totally agree with um, in, in terms of pro profession. I've also, you know, very much a defender of uh, majoring. I I switched just for the record from uh, applied mathematics to uh, Jewish studies in, in undergrad. So I'm, I'm very much on- uh, on, on this team, um, what would you say to then the follow-up question of, well, at least maybe in, in the 80s when you were studying, you know, humanities or English literature, you were in a robust, you know, a variety and an array of ideologies. Now, if, if my, you know, future daughter is going to study English, you know, she's going to come out some, you know, some type of Marxist, you know, person <laughs> who, you know, won't, won't come on family trips to Israel. No, that it won't happen because she studied at the university and, you know, Je Jeffrey Kopstein spoke about this last night. Um, if we're a liberal brainwashing machine, we're not doing a good job of it. There's no evidence that professors succeed in radicalizing their students. Whatever they're getting, they're getting from the, uh, whether from the internet or from social media or from at home, they're not getting it from the university. Um, we don't, we're not, and the fact is that most professors aren't radical. Most professors are just standard liberals. You know, it's funny, you know, if I think back to my college years in the early 80s, uh, we actually had a death to Israel rally at UCLA, not we, I mean, it was in, 19, in the fall of 1982, 
General Assembly of Jewish Federations was holding their annual conference in LA and Menachem Begin, the prime minister of Israel, was coming to address. Now he actually didn't address because his wife died that day and he had to fly home. But um, there were protests, this was during the Lebanon war and there were protests at UCLA. And um, during the protest, one of the protesters led the crowd chanting death to Israel. Now at that point, UCLA had about a dozen different Jewish student groups all of whom did not do anything together. You know, there was Hillel, which did social programming, and then there were the Greeks, and there was, you know, AE Pi and uh, ZBT, and then there was the Progressive Zionist Caucus, and there was Chabad. They were all doing all these things. And so then- I used to say, the uh, joke when I was there was, there's enough uh, Jews and funding for like four good organizations, so that's why there's 12. Yes, and so what they did is we came together and created the Jewish Student Council, which came together in crisis. And, um, and then we we it was how to deal with that, but for the most part that was it that was not a common thing. And then I know this the vice president's office at UCLA started doing an annual retreat, which I participated in up at the UC Conference House, where they bring all the student groups together to kind of talk about issues and to build bridges. So I mean, there were, I went to protest. I protested speakers in college. Noam Chomsky came and spoke on campus, and so I was part of a protest outside. We didn't stop him from speaking. We just handed flyers to people going into the building saying, here's what he said about Jews in Israel and his connection with Holocaust deniers, right? That's how you did it. You you could protest. It was nothing wrong with protesting. It was you let the speaker speak. Um, I would say even all the way um, through grad school into the early 2000s, there was never a problem with an Israeli speaker um, on campus. And I would say this problem is very recent. I mean, I know at UCI in 2010, Michael Oren, there was that was this kind of four spice, as my mother would say, an appetizer, where he his talk was disrupted. Um, but that's relatively recent. That's it's really, and I would say, and particularly since the massacres, um, it's gotten very, very bad. Um, I was at the AJS in December, and hearing from other went to the program for Jew, directors of Jewish studies, two hours of misery. I thought it would be cathartic, but no, everyone who spoke is like the worst term of my professional career, the last fall, uh, what happening on my campus. Every it was every, That was what you heard from for two hours from everyone in the room. It's bad across America right now in, yeah. in campus. It's the worst I have ever seen it. There's nothing comes close to it. Which is why, I mean, which is why, again, just just demographically, I'm I'm worried about I'm genuinely worried about the future of universities to be universities and not vocational schools because again, the the public is is taking notes. And so, you know, I, I can't imagine, I mean, I haven't looked at any polling data on this. I'd be curious to to see it. I can't imagine the public's um view of universities has gone up in the last four months. I mean, no, you it's, it's, the, uh, the the Harvard and Penn and MIT hearings and just so much. I mean, everybody has a story now of, you know what's what's happening on the campus. Um, so it would behoove me to not go in this direction because, you know, for, for listeners who might be familiar with your work, you really are a scholar of uh, modern Jewish thought, specifically late um, 19th century German Jewish thought, um, Henrich Gretz, um, who you are currently writing or publishing a book on. Um, but just to ask you as a question of sort of uh, modern Jewish thought, where do you put this moment in terms of, you know, a zoomed out picture of, oh, of modern Jewish history? You know, what is this sort of, how are people going to be teaching about this in, you know, 2000 to 100 on, on campuses and in Jewish studies departments? I don't know. I mean, that's a hard one. I, that, you're, um, it is the, the last, well, let's see, seven years in general. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be political here. Since the election of Trump was a shock. And what was happening during the Trump and then the attempted coup on January 6th. Since the, um, since the attempted coup on January 6th, I have had repeated nightmares. And it took, I usually I stress nightmares. They're all, everyone gets these. It's the, you know, last week of the term, I've been enrolled in the class and I haven't done any paper and I forgot about it and I can't find the syllabus, that kind of work stress. We this all is get, what happens when you get both a JD and a PhD, you've been in school for too long. It's, yeah, it's, you know. And then, um, but now I was having dreams where I was looking for a place to live. And I told me, I was like, why? I have a house. Why am I having this? And then I realized I'm having nightmares of displacement. I'm having nightmares of exile, which is a first. And like, I'm afraid I have to, will have to leave this country. Um, I had my first martyrdom nightmare on Saturday, on Sunday morning, not Saturday night. 
never had that before. Um, I'm scared. Um, scared about living in this country. Uh, that was something, I, I w went to a talk in December at Villa Aurora, which is Leon Fuchtwanger's uh, house in the Palisades. And Leon Fuchtwanger was a novelist, in, a German novelist, Jewish novelist who had to flee Nazi Germany, ended up in France, went through two French concentration camps until he was sent to America. And in 1943, he gave a talk. And at this program I went to, they read an excerpt of it. And the talk was the, pro the working problems of the writer in exile. And listening to what he said in 1943, I found myself not listening to it as, oh, look, here's a new historical source on what Jews went through during the Holocaust. But, oh, this is some advice for me in the future, what I'm going to have to experience. Well, how will it be for me if I go into exile? Um, that was a first where I was listening to exile, not as something historical, but as something potentially personal to me. Um, that's new. Mm -hmm. um, the the conditions on campus right now, I, I've never seen anything like it. Um, and, you know, we talk about public discourse. Um, the assault on Jews in America right now is very specific to college campuses, because um, even though it's not a majority on campus by any means, it's a very vocal minority. That's where it's most vocal. And that's where it's most it, happening the most. And we've never seen that before in the US. And I don't know what historical precedence, and it's hard for me to see it because I'm in the middle of it. And I don't have that historical perspective to step back and say, oh, here are the trends. Oh, this is just like when the Jews were segregated in Poland in 1937, 38. You know, it's not like that. Um, I, don't, I, I don't see the bigger picture right now because I feel like I'm too much in the midst of it. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating. I mean, as you're obviously well aware, I'm teaching a class on American Jewish history now. I'm doing yeah. it for your department. So yeah. that's why, um, of course, you know the background. But one of the interesting academic debates and most Jewish historians or most Jews, if you stop on them on the street, would sign off on, you know, what's called American Jewish exceptionalism, right? Yeah. This idea that really from the outset, even before 1776, America was just an exceptional place because of separation of church and state and the liberties that at least most of the colonies had. And, you know, even this idea of what, you know, Jonathan Sarna calls, you know, free market Judaism of, you know, you have a choice and it's not the chief rabbi appointed by the church or by the king, you know, it's, you know, whatever guy wants to open up a shoal that can outcompete the other. Um, and so when, whenever I hear American Jews talk about comparisons, there's one side of me that, that wants to push back and say, I don't know, America really is different. On the other hand, that I have the sort of other angel that that pops up on my shoulder and says, well, listen, I mean, people always thought that whatever they were in is different. I mean, the Jews in France, you know, thought that things were different. The Jews in Germany thought that things were different. Jews in Russia, you know, before Alexander II was uh, assassinated, thought, you know, oh, here it's different. And so, I mean, how do you sort of balance those? I mean, both as a, as a historian and somebody, you know, both probably thinking both academically and personally, do you have sort of a, an intuition there? So David Nuremberg wrote a really important book called Anti-Judaism a few years ago. And his point is that anti-Judaism as a movement in Western civilization goes back, it predates Christianity. It goes back, we can see it already in the Roman, in, you know, he's looking at something that happens under Caligula and where he begins it. And it then proceeds into the Western religions of the Christianity and Islam, because Islam is a Western religion. And one of his biggest points is that anti judaism what happens, so there's a lot, a lot of hatred about Jews is not any different from any other minority group in history. And you can do a lot of comparisons with the Roma, for example. A lot of the stereotypes of the Roma are the same stereotypes about Jews. But what makes anti-Jewish hatred different is in the Western tradition, Jews were used as an ideological other. So if you were battling an opponent over theology or political theory or anything, you would um, accuse your opponent of being Jewish or Judaizing or advocating a Jewish position. And they really weren't, had nothing to do with real Jews or real Jewish thought. Um, and the result is that there's a very long history in the West of doing that. And I think when Jews came to America, they said, here we, they didn't say here we can be white because whiteness is specific to America and they came from non places outside America. But in America allowed Jews to be white. Uh, they came from places where they were other and they were still othered here too, but not in the same degree. 
But what we're seeing is those traditions carry over into the present, into the US. So if you think, for example, if you think whiteness is the best thing ever, right? What you know, white, you know, then you think not only are the Jews not white, but they are the chief enemy of whiteness in America. If you think America is a is a white supremacist state with racism built into its bones, then not only do you think the Jews are white, but they are the epitome of whiteness. If you um if you uh think uh that uh there is a conspiracy of hostile elites uh to either on the right globalize the world under their control, then you think that Jews are a part of that. You got QAnon saying that, and you've got all this stuff on George Soros. And if on the others, on the on the far left, you think that it's all a hostile elite of big businesses and media and corporations, then it's all on behalf of Jews. If you think that um, we have to protect the nation against internationalism and globalism, then Jews are the rootless cosmopolitan trying to break down our nation. If you think that nationalism is a good thing, or do you think that nationalism is terrible and we should move away from parochialism, then Jews are the most nationalist uh, reactionary group out there. And so all these, um, this approach that we think of in terms of Europe and the medieval period, the early modern period, the 20th and 20th century, where you, people are fighting among themselves and they're using Jews as their cudgel, that's all happening here now too. So sure, and this is why, I mean, the, the, this, the irony of what you're saying, not, not you specifically, but of, of you know, just the, the history is that all of that is is the argument in, in my head for why I, I do identify as a, at least political Zionist in, in a strong sense, because the, the solution, I mean, obviously we can debate about whether or not Zionism, you know, ended in 48 or not, but but all of that leads one or could easily lead one to say, Okay, this is so systemic. You know, Nuremberg's great uh, book is a uh, uh, Nimberg's. What is it, David Nimberg? David Nuremberg, N I R E N B E R G. Got it. So, he, I mean, his book is incredible. I read it a couple years ago, and and all of that basically leads you to say, okay, well, we really do need our sort of our own place where you know where we at least have some defenses from from this attack on on the right and left. And and one of the things that I keep telling students is that the irony of this proliferation of really what I call anti-Semitic anti-Zionism as opposed to, yeah. you know, there is a non-anti-Semitic anti-Zionism right. that exists, but the, at least the anti-Semitic anti-Zionism itself is the reason for Zionism in the first place. So it's almost dialectical in some in some strange sense where if, if one could imagine, you know, the counterfactual world of post-October 7th America, where everybody came came around and was supporting the Jewish community and DEI centers and campus groups and even Students for Justice in Palestine were all coming and saying, you know, this was terrible. Oh my goodness, you know, the beheadings and the rapes and all of that. In some sense, and I'm not saying, you know, again, it's hard to run the counterfactual, my, one's commitment to Zionism might have actually dipped because one might have seen that situation and said, well, wait a minute, Israel seems less safe for Jews and America, right, look how supportive everyone's being, right? The diaspora seems not so bad at all. But of course, that's not how it how it ended up. And so I think actually, ironically, commitments to Zionism have, have actually spiked for, for, I think, good good reason here. Yeah. And I would just say, in case any of you are thinking of making Aliyah, uh, and want, I looked it up, okay, this is where it's come to. Um, you don't go through the Israeli embassy or the Israeli consulate. It's actually really old school. You have to go to the Jewish Agency website. So the Jewish Agency, which comes out of the first Zionist Congress, which predates the state, still handles Aliyah to Israel. That's where all the paperwork is. Wow. So just so, FYI I mean, on that. Yeah, there we go. I mean, <laughs> helpful, helpful in from an historian. Yeah. Uh, it's still. It, I was kind of shocked. I thought, oh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's now a go separate government. So of course the government would handle immigration. It doesn't. It's still the Jewish Agency. Got so. it. Well, listen, ne Nefesh Benefesh is not currently a sponsor of the podcast, but maybe I'll have to make a, a phone call to them. And yeah. um, so we've been talking for about an hour. I wanted to see if there was anything else that you wanted to say, anything else you wanted to discuss, or any just final comments you have. Well, I'm just going to say what I, I, um, that the the university, the public university, stands for academic freedom. And academic freedom, a lot of people who aren't in the university have no idea what that means. And it just think, they think it means some radical Marxist who's trying to convince their children to be trans. Um, but what it is, is the ability to speak and to teach. And 
it's critical to the functioning of the university. And we have now reached the place where academic freedom exists for everyone but for Jews. And if that happens, then the public university will cease to exist. It, it strikes at the heart of the message of the public university. And this is a critical moment for public universities that they have to step up to. And, they, and I think mo a lot of universities don't know how to do it. They're confused. They, they don't understand what's happening. And their lawyers are telling them, you know, bash the lawyers. You know, it's, they're, you know, they're, they're, you know don't say anything that will uh, expose us to liability. And the result is that Jews are sacrificed. And it's, um, this, is a, this is a testing moment for the public university in America. And we'll, I don't know where it's going to come out. And I don't know what's going to happen in the next year from now. Um, and I, I, I cannot tell you how many people I know, family members and friends and colleagues, who are in the process of getting alternate citizenship. Or who tell me they're thinking of retiring because they don't want to be here anymore. They, they, have, they can't deal with it. So we're in a very, very difficult place right now. This is by far the worst I've ever seen. Um, in, I have been in a public university on and off since 1980, and I've never, ever, ever seen anything close to what we're going through now. Well, Professor Jeffrey Woodinger, thank you so much for coming on and discussing oh, all of these. You're welcome. Things. My pleasure. Thank you so much.